Thank you. It is an honor to be at Buenos Aires Law School, and I'm grateful that you would permit a conversation about a project very dear to my heart, Creative Commons, to be had here in this extraordinarily beautiful building and this great law school. We come to celebrate a conference that has brought together members of a community from 80 countries around the world to discuss a common set of values and ideals about how to make culture and knowledge more widely accessible. And in framing this conference, the amazing team from Argentina has asked this question, what we share, what we share. And I want to suggest that what we share is actually way too little. Too little from our culture. We share with each other too little in our cultures and we need to share more. And we share too little legally. Or put differently, too much of what we share, we share illegally. We share against the law. And in my view, the law must let us share more. We need to share more as cultures around the world. This is one cause. There needs to be one movement. And there is one long way to go until we get to the place where we share more. So to introduce the particular part of this sharing I want to focus on tonight, I want to make it a little bit more personal. So I just came from a vacation with my kids. My kids are very young. And they are obsessed, or they were obsessed over this vacation with just two things. We took them to the beach. I thought they would like the water, the sun, the games. The two things they were obsessed with were number one, YouTube, <laughs> and number two, a game called Minecraft. <laughs> How many have played Minecraft? That's extraordinary. Okay. Minecraft. <laughs> Now it turns out, you wouldn't expect this, but it turns out these things go together, YouTube and Minecraft. They go together as the game. My child, my oldest, who learned, began to learn this game just two months ago, is now an, an admin on a server, having learned everything he learned from YouTube. But they also go together as an expression of culture. So let me give you some examples. I'm sure many of you saw this music video, which my kids played over and over on our vacation. As is happening in YouTube, of course, many people make parodies of these videos. So here's one particular parody. I'm watching you in my yard, making my nipples rock hard. Wish you'd lose the bodyguard so I could lick your face. I love your black nappy hair and those hot suits that you wear. I'm wearing your underwear that I stole from your plane. I'm a total psycho. Bye. Well, here's another one that my kids love particularly. My oldest son, my best. We met this rapper online. He's so adorable, he's nine. We have backer blades. are nothing compared to the one remix which my kids found and we had to watch 100 times. <laughs> Thank you. 
example, here's another example. I'm sure many of you saw this. Well, I know that at least half a billion people have seen this. I'm sure some of you are among those. Open Gangnam Style! Gangnam Style! So my kids like that a little bit, but they were really, my youngest daughter was really obsessed with this one here, for reasons I can't figure out. Open Kim Jong Star. Kim Jong Star. compared to this one. <laughs> Take in Minecraft style. Minecraft style. Take in a hole just one more time until I score this. Strike break shot. Okay, like ice cream and chocolate. What I learned this vacation is that if you do not control your children when they get near YouTube and Minecraft, all of their time will be spent obsessed with these two forms of cultural expression. And this is not just a lesson about parenting. It's a story about something that's happening within our culture, something about how our culture is changing to understand what expression and creativity is to be. I've described this as remix, but what I want you to see in the context, concept of remix is the way in which remix is a time-honored tradition of call and response. There is a creative call that asks for a culture to respond, and we see that response increasingly in the ways in which digital technologies invite people to share. Now when you think about the problems of copyright, I want to say this is just one issue to talk about. I want to focus on this one. There are others I won't talk about. Issues like, in my view, the need to return to formalities in the context of copyright, to explore ideas such as the German Green Party has advanced of cultural flat rates to deal with the problem of quote-unquote piracy, to think about registries, to make it easier, to make the system run efficiently. All of these ideas are central to how we think about how copyright law must be improved, but they are secondary to how we think about how copyright law connects to the way culture is changing. If there's a fundamental idea about how copyright law must change, in my view, the fundamental idea is that it needs to deregulate culture. We have to find a way to make it so that culture is not so heavily entwined with the regulation of law, to regulate culture where it makes sense and not where it does no good. And to illuminate that idea, I want to focus on this one example of what I call remix. Now this practice of call and response is something that's been happening, I think, powerfully over the past eight years. Here's another example, which I'm sure many of you saw this original music video, which was the call that it invited millions of these types of copy responses. So there's amateur, there's professional, there's Justin Timberlake. There's high class, there's... Or here in the context of more popular concerns. Saúde, boa, 
Hey, I got the new damn for y'all called a soldier boy. You got a punch then crank back three times from left to right. That was the call. It invited this response. You! Soldier Boy, what's up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. You! You got a punch, then crank back three times from the left. Oh, and then this was another response. You! Soldier Boy, what's up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. She got a punch, then crank back three times from the Okay, and then one final example that will be particularly important by the time we get to the end of this talk. So, many of you might have seen this great film from the 1980s, 1985, John Hughes's The Breakfast Club and The Modern Brat Pack. Um, someone was inspired by this film and this song by the band Lena, uh, by the band Phoenix, called Listomania. And they were inspired to try to mix these two forms of cultural expression together. So they produced this video. And it started inviting a certain kind of response. So first, people in Brooklyn got together and they did their own Brooklyn version of that remix. here, you've got to follow the same form, but you've got to change it enough to make it localized. So here's the San Francisco version of the same. YouTube, you can find literally scores of these from countries around the world, places around the world, I don't know what Cousins is, but everywhere around the world, people remixing it exactly this way. Now what I want you to think about is the way this is a kind of culture. It's not the kind of culture I grew up with, where we sit passively and consume stuff produced for us. It's a culture where people feel empowered, entitled, obligated to participate in the creation and recreation of their culture, produced by, enabled by, a certain kind of technology. Not the technology of broadcasting or the technology of fixed medium expression, but the technologies of YouTube and Facebook and digital technologies, including the PC. Those technologies make possible both efficient consumption of creative work and efficient, at least amateur, production of creative work. They facilitate listening as well as speaking. They facilitate what we could call reading as well as writing. They encourage what I've called a read-write culture, and this is the image of a read-write culture. They push against a read-only culture, the culture which consumes but doesn't feel entitled to create. And it gives us a sense that maybe it's just the 20th century in the history of human culture where culture is read only and everything before, and there's a supporter of this in the back, I take it, one at least, everything before and everything after, two, three, four, five, is read right. Okay, now. We lawyers, especially, but all of us, need to recognize this as good. 
this change as good. This change in the form of how we express is good. It is good because it encourages a wider range of creativity, greater diversity, and on balance, wildly better than the insanely boring life of cultural production before digital technologies. And recognize as a kind of insanity those who pipe up every once in a while and say we need to go back to those dark ages of four channels producing 17 shows a week. Or if you don't buy that, then this is what we must buy, we lawyers especially, even if you don't think it's good. You're stuck in the 1960s or 70s or 80s, even if the question we must ask is, by what right do we stop it? By what right do we discourage it? Because if the objective of cultural policy is to encourage creativity, this is creativity. It is to encourage creativity of both professional and amateur creators. It must do those two things, not just one. And what harm is it if cultural policy encourages more of creators who create for the love of creating rather than for the money. Now in my tradition, in the American tradition, in the tradition of copyright law in America, we have a way of saying this. We have a doctrine in American copyright law called fair use, which not technically but effectively puts copyright on the defensive. It says to copyright when a copyright lawyer asserts the right to control a particular use, it says back, justify your control. Tell me why it makes sense for the law to give you the right to stop me from remixing your work as I have. And though I think there are few virtues, relatively few virtues in American law, American IP law, at least giving a forum for this kind of a question, a forum for asking what makes sense, makes it possible for the system to reflect upon the ways in which culture and the produ production of culture is changing. So when we stand back and say, what do we share, and I say we share too little, we can see the way we share too little through this account. First, the creativity I'm describing, this creativity of remix is something we do share. This common culture of expression is encouraged by this common technology, a technology accessible globally because of something called IP, as in TCP IP, something that functions universally in our world, producing an opportunity for humans to be humans, meaning humans creating and sharing their creativity to create and recreate and share. This is the creativity that we now increasingly share, at least our children share. But this law that I was describing, we don't share. IP law, IP here as in law, we don't share. It is importantly different. We live in a world where we speak as if there's effectively a globalized IP regime, but there's not. There are <coughs> important ways in which the regimes differ, and especially with respect to remix. And we forget that, or we in the United States tend to forget that difference. We tend to forget that what we think of as our rights, like the fair use right, which the Supreme Court has said is a constitutionally protected right, is local to the United States. And that indeed what we think of as our rights are viewed as wrongs elsewhere in the world. Especially in the context of remix. I was struck by this image taken at a protest in Berlin against ACTA, you see on the right here, Rechts auf Remix, Right to Remix, which at first I thought my publisher had arranged, because this was just a protest that they had to have a right to my book remix, but it turns out 
There is an organization in Germany, I'm proud to say some of our members are behind it, an organization in Germany which just launched an English version of their site, the therighttoremix.org. And the manifesto of this organization expresses this point quite powerfully. As it says, we live in an age of remakes. Creativity and culture have always drawn from previous works, but with the internet and digital technologies, the creative reuse of works has been taken to a whole new level. More people are able to edit and share a greater range of works than ever before. More than ever, it has become clear that everything is remixed. And what this organization does is to protect, to push the idea that law must protect this freedom. And it doesn't across the world just now. And as the site quite powerfully argues, Creative Commons is not a solution to this problem. Indeed, in the United States, Creative Commons licenses explicitly say they don't mean to modify fair use, but what that means is in the rest of the world, the licenses don't necessarily provide to the cultural objects that need to be remixed the freedoms that a culture should recognize. So it is these differences in laws. The rights here are different. The freedoms here are different. And my view is they shouldn't be different. This cultural form of expression, this creativity through the capacity to remix, should be a general right, a general human right to take, to remix, and to share or as Apple put it before they became a music company, to rip, mix, and burn. We need to share more. We need to share more legally, and to do that, the law must change, if we're going to share more legally. <coughs> but to get to the place that the law recognizes this need to share more legally, we, especially we lawyers, need to celebrate the creativity and sharing that these forms of expression are demonstrated, that they use to capture the generations that come after us. Now, so how do we do that? How do we push an agenda to get the world to recognize the power and value in this form of expression? How do we get there? Well, I agree with the right to remix.org. Creative Commons is not the solution to that problem. This problem needs real change in real law. That's necessary, if this freedom is to be secured. But Creative Commons prepares us for this solution. It prepares a culture for a solution. By building and encouraging a certain practice that shows the world exactly what creators actually choose. What the creators choose, not their lawyers. And we can, in that practice of demonstrating what creators actually choose, encourage and empower us in this fight. For the fight here about this freedom is inevitable. So for example, if you look at the Creative Commons licenses, one thing that's quite obvious is we're a little bit taken with the concept of attribution. Every single one of our licenses requires that the licensor, licensee, use the work, attributing the work back to the original creator. We believe this expresses a certain respect for the creator. But that respect doesn't come from copyright law alone, especially in the American tradition. It comes from values Creative Commons adds to copyright law. And those additions have been noticed and have influenced policy. So in 2006, the Copyright Office of the United States government did a report on orphan works. And in the course of the report, they recognized how the vast majority of Creative Commons licensed works out there were works that required attribution. And they took that to reflect a norm inside of the culture of creative industries that says people ought at least, at a minimum, to be attributing when they use a work. And that norm, which we helped manifest through the way we deployed our licenses, is increasingly returning now to the normative framework of what people think copyright is. 
law should be. And my view is we need the same kind of recognition with remix. So how would we get there? Three ways. First, by the practice of remix. Second, by the defense of remix. And third, by embarrassing those who resist us. So first, the practice. This turns out to be the easiest part. Because as I demonstrated in the beginning of my talk, it turns out to be irresistible, at least to a generation, to engage in this form of expression. So long as there is a computer and an internet connection, it's going to happen. And sites like Right to Remix, in their petitioning to get governments to recognize this right, have begun to collect the very best of these remixes, and you can vote as you sign the petition on which you find to be the best, so that we can surface to others, others more skeptical about the artistic value in this form of expression, demonstrations of why this culturally and politically is so important. So we will practice, we can't stop ourselves from practicing this form of expression. And then we have to defend it. Because it turns out it's attacked everywhere around the world by the lawyers of the world, and in the United States, too. So I'm sure some of you um, saw this uh, talk that I gave about seven years ago at the TED conference, which has gotten more than a million different views now um, from people around the world. This talk about the limits to copyright law, I think it's a talk titled, as this talk is, How Laws um, Choke Creativity. People from around the world view this. Millions view, no, more than a million have viewed this and sent many, many comments back to me. But not in Germany do you get to see this. Because in Germany, <coughs> this talk about how creativity is being strangled by the law is not accessible because the law says we can't show it because in the course of my talk, like this talk tonight, I used a clip from some music that is licensed by GEMA, and of course I didn't pay for the permission to use that clip to demonstrate how culture is being stifled by the law, so in Germany this is not accessible. Now this happens all the time. All the time I get these letters from YouTube like this, telling me my video is violating somebody's copyright law, and all the time I have to sit back down and systematically respond with a counter notice telling them, no, 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 this is fair use. And they force you to type out, I promise I will not violate copyright law. Well, like, well, like Bart Simpson has to write on the laws, how he's not going to violate. But the point is, this is just an absurd system. Absolutely absurd. Now, here's the example I want you to focus on for a second. So, in June, the, just, for, uh, just at the end of June, I got this letter from YouTube telling me that this talk was violating somebody's rights. That talk was a talk I had given in 2010 at a conference in Korea, the CC Asia Pacific Conference, a conference organized by the Korean, uh, Creative Commons Korea crowd, a really wonderful conference. In the course of that video, I showed the same sequence I showed you today, the same sequence around Listomania. And what I was noticed was that um, that violated copyright law to post that. So I counter noticed. I sent them a response back, as YouTube gives you the ability to do, that says, this is fair use. I have a right to do this. The law protects my right to do this. Indeed, the Constitution has been interpreted to guarantee me the right to do this. So you can't block my video open. This counter notice I sent in July 8th at 6 p.m. I then got this response back. We will be commencing legal proceedings against the following copy, uh, for the copyright infringement in the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts. That's my home. That's my home address. This will commence in 72 hours if this claim is not responded to in the proper way. That counter notice came two hours after I had sent my notice to them, telling them that what I had posted was consistent with the laws of copyright. Now, there's no way in two hours they even thought about it what I had said. They didn't care about what I said. What they wanted to do was to threaten me with legal action. And in the United States, copyright litigation is extremely expensive. In, in theory, there's up to $150,000 per violation of copyright law if it's a, if it's a 
punitive damage uh, finding, not likely in a context like this, but even the cost of defending to hire the lawyers is extraordinarily high. It is an absurd threat. And when I got that, I said, someday, somebody ought to fight back against that absurd threat. And then I thought, that someday ought to be today. Literally today. Because today, in Massachusetts, with the help of EFF, we have filed the lawsuit Lessig versus Liberation Music. A lawsuit that challenges them and claims damages against them for their abuse of the copyright system for the purpose of shutting down my form of expression. Now, because of EFF, I'm able to bring this claim. And because of the support of organizations like EFF, we might be able to achieve exactly what the copyright owners say they are trying to achieve when they sue people for, quote, piracy and force them to pay $100,000 damages for their violation of copyright law. If it's true, extreme penalties are necessary to create the right incentive for, quote, pirates, end quote, then it should be true extreme penalties are necessary against music companies who abuse their power to silence people who are trying to practice the rights the law gives them. So today, thank EFF for fighting this absurd claim. And then the third thing we need to do is to embarrass them. Not the lawyers, lawyers can't be embarrassed. <laughs> but to embarrass the artists who associate with those lawyers. I'm sure many of you saw this example. This uh, little kid. You might not notice that this is music of the artist formerly known as Prince in the background. This child finds it quite amusing. He dances. His mother captured this on video, uploaded it to YouTube. Mother got a similar threat from Prince telling the mother if she didn't take it down, then she would be sued for a copyright violation. EFS stood, took that case as well and won, but the purpose of a case like that was to make the artists take responsibility for their crazy lawyers. Because an artist like Prince has no interest in being associated with insanity like that. And other artists who are maybe more tenuous in their fame than Prince would certainly defend their freedoms by encouraging exactly the right response from their lawyers, lawyers who typically behave a lot like that child does, just following the bounce of the music and not thinking about what they're doing. We need these three changes, these practice and defense and embarrassment if this movement is going to build the change that we need to liberate these cultures to make what is insane now sane. And in this, I believe Creative Commons has a role. If Creative Commons provides this platform for sane creativity, a showcase, a demonstration of the need to do this in the way that we've done it, then it builds that recognition in our culture. But I also think that we in Creative Commons need to do this better. There's something troubling even to a lawyer that Creative Commons today celebrates the ability to release our legal code 4.0, but we function on what we think of, what I think of as technical code 1.1. We haven't seen as much progress in the way in which we make the technical tools accessible as we focus on the process project to make the legal licenses more workable. And we need to do this better. But more importantly than the technical parts, the community for reform needs to encourage this better because many in this community recognize that the people who've come into this meeting in Argentina are the core of that movement. We build that core globally in every part of the world, to build the recognition globally in every part of the world that the human freedom to create 
needs to be defended, defended not just against crazy lawyers, but the defense against those who see creativity as something they need to control. Now, let me just end with one final reflection. In 2007, at a conference like this, this one in Dubrovnik, the iCommons conference celebrating this community, I announced at that conference that I was going to stop the work that I had been doing around copyright to focus on an issue I thought of as more fundamental, the issue of corruption in the political system that made it so hard for us to make progress in copyrights and in climate change and in healthcare legislation and in every issue that the United States government faces. I made that announcement in 2007 because in 2006 I was visited by a friend. boy named Aaron Swartz. A boy had been central to the development of Creative Commons. When we launched Creative Commons, a younger version of this boy introduced our technology. Well, thanks. Now that you've seen the theory behind Creative Commons, it's time to show you some of the practice. So when you come to, your, come to our website here, then you go to choose license. It gives you this list of options, explains what it means, and you thought three. So everyone knew him as a certain boy genius, as he was when I first met him, as he continued to be, as he helped develop Reddit and helped make the architecture and policy around information freer for everyone. A single purpose in his life was this public purpose of making the world better in his vision of what that would be. But in 2006, he came to a famous Berlin conference, um, uh, Chaos Computer uh, Club conference, the 23rd version of it, this was their logo, and he visited me when I was at this place, the American Academy, and we had a long talk, and in the course of the talk, he asked me a question. He said, how are you ever and then he plugged into that question something that I was pushing for in the area of copyright. How are you ever going to get Congress to do blah, blah, blah around copyright? Given, as he put it, the corruption of the American political system. Now, by corruption, neither he nor I are talking about congressmen taking bribes. We're not talking about anybody violating anybody's rights or laws. What we're talking about is a certain kind of influence inside the political system, produced by the way we fund campaigns that makes it impossible for Congress to sensibly address any important public policy issue. And indeed, the crisis is so great now that I don't think there is one important public policy issue that affects money in the United States that the government has even the capacity to address. But when Aaron raised that question to me, my response was, you know, Aaron, it's not my field. Not my field. I do IP. And he said, as an academic, you mean? And I said, yes, as an academic, that's not my field. So he paused and he said, but what about as a citizen? As a citizen, is it your field? Now many in this room, many in this room remember Aaron, remember that this was his power. This amazing, completely unpatented power, like the very best of teachers. He always taught by asking the question. Like the most effective leaders, his questions were always on a path. And they coerced you, those questions. If you wanted to be as he was, they forced you. They forced you to live your life differently. And that's what he had done a hundred times in my life when he committed suicide. Articles were written like this, Aaron Swartz's mentor, Lessig, remembers him. But I was his mentee. He was the mentor. He was the teacher. 
when I think about what he was teaching and reflect on it in the context of a global summit, this thing is also something we share, this corruption. Democratic government everywhere suffers from corruption. It's different everywhere. Its particular form is different in Italy and in France and in Germany and in the United States and in Asian democracies. The particular form is different. But the general problem is everywhere. That explains the growth of what we can think of as this global anti-corruption movement. If we cc'd it, we would have something like that. That would be the logo against corruption, anti-corruption or something like that. That would be the CC logo for it. And what Aaron coerced me into doing was to leaving this movement to fight the anti-corruption fight in America. But this other thing, this free culture movement, that I stepped away from six years ago, maybe because I stepped away from it, I don't know, has had real progress since I left. Progress as it's been globalized in the fight and expressed this fight globally in a powerful and effective way. Also successful domestically, astonishingly so domestically, in a fight to stop something referred to as SOPA and PIPA, Hollywood's latest attempt to fight, quote, piracy with what is clearly the most dramatic change in the architecture of internet freedom. That fight was taken up over a period of a year and a half by Aaron and his colleagues and eventually united an extraordinary community. Uh, people from the right and people from the left, people from the United States and people from outside the United States, companies and nonprofits, including Wikipedia, Reddit, and Craigslist. And in the end, there was a total victory as they did what no one said was possible. They stopped the legislation. And in his very last speech, Aaron described. And that was when this part of this it was for me to believe after all this, we had won. The thing that everyone said was impossible, that some of the biggest companies in the world had written off as kind of a pipe dream, had it happened. We did it. We won. And then we started rubbing them. <laughs> you all know what happened next. Wikipedia went black. Reddit went black. Craigslist went black. The phone lines on Capitol Hill flat out melted. Members of Congress started rushing to issue statements retracting their support for the bill that they were promoting just a couple days ago. It was just ridiculous. I mean, th there's a chart from the time that captures it pretty well. It says something like, January 14th on one side. It has this big, long list of names supporting the bill. And then just a few lonely people opposing it. And then on the other side, it says January 15th. And now it's totally reversed. Everyone is opposing it. Just a few lonely names still hanging on in support. I mean, this really was unprecedented. Don't take my word for it, but ask former Senator Chris Dodd, now the chief lobbyist for Hollywood. He admitted, after he lost, that he had masterminded the whole evil plan. And he told the New York Times he'd never seen anything like it during his many years in Congress. And everyone I've spoken to agrees. The people rose up and they caused a sea change in Washington. Not the press, which refused to cover the story, just coincidentally, the parent companies all happen to be lobbying for the bill. Not the politicians, who were pretty much unanimously in favor of it. And not the companies who had all but given up trying to stop it and decided it was inevitable. It was really stopped by the people. This was his victory. And if you knew him, the smile he's showing there is about the biggest smile you would ever see whenever he was referring to something that he had done. This was his victory, it was our victory. But of course it wasn't his only battle. At the same time he was waging this battle to stop Silpa Pippa, he was also being pursued by the United States government. He was suing him, he was prosecuting him, criminally prosecuting him, threatening many, many years in jail for alleged violation of the rights of certain copyright holders as he 
was alleged to be downloading academic articles which he thought should be free. There was no victory for him in this fight. It was a defeat. A defeat that was so overwhelming to him it led to his own death. And we need to remember something about the character of that defeat. That that defeat was unfair. There are two parts to that. The one part is, as we look at this alleged crime, it's clear there probably was no crime. If you look at the indictment the government issued against Aaron, the claim was that without authorization, he had accessed MIT's network without authorization. But the problem for the government's case is that MIT is an open network. It explicitly permits anybody on its property to access its network. Meaning he wasn't unauthorized, he was authorized. Meaning the criminal law which turned upon whether he was authorized or not could not have been brought against him. Now this was not a fact well recognized in the prosecution, certainly by the prosecutors. It was recognized by MIT. Indeed, there was one person who explicitly brought this point to the administration of MIT, explicitly asked this question. You know this is an open network. And if it's an open network, he can't be prosecuted. But MIT did nothing with that question. And then here's the second part. MIT issued a report, really powerful report, written by Hal Abelson, who is a board member of Creative Commons, a man of enormous integrity, and I respect greatly. In the course of the report, Hal Abelson revealed something which is really quite extraordinary. And Darrell Issa, who's a Republican leader in the House of Representatives, has now pointed to this fact and begun to raise an investigation about it. And as the report, as the newspaper article here refers to it, the MIT report indicated that Hyman, he's the prosecutor, was angry. Why was he angry? Because there was an online petition started by Demand Progress, that's the organization Aaron started to fight, criticizing Hyman, criticizing a government official. And Hyman thought that was foolish, and more than foolish, he said it turned the case, brought the case to an institutional level. What does that mean? That means he is going to do everything he can to get the maximum penalty he can against Aaron Swartz. Now, this is astonishing that in a free society, a government official believes he is entitled to exact a greater punishment against a defendant because friends of the defendant have criticized the government. Nothing is more fundamental to a free speech tradition than that we are allowed to criticize the government. And the idea that the government thinks it's entitled to increase the criminal penalties against a defendant because they've been criticized is outrageous. Outrageous. And yet there's no apology, there's no official criticism of this behavior from the president on down. The United States government defends its prosecution of a boy whose only objective in his whole life was to make the world a better place. He lost. And his loss is our loss. And it's not just Aaron. We need to remember. Our friend Basel has been in jail today 526 days since he was picked up by Syrian thugs and locked up because he too advanced the ideals which Aaron Swartz was fighting for. Ideals of access and 
knowledge free culture. For 526 days, he has been subjected to Syrian prison. Despite an extraordinary movement from around the world to free Basel, there is a government there too that is not embarrassed by its refusal to acknowledge the simple freedoms which Basel fights for. As we gather to celebrate everything that we've done, to celebrate everything you've done, to celebrate the ways in which you've changed how culture is made and shared and given people a vision for how this might work. As we celebrate, we need to remember that. These are our inspirations. This is their movement. This is Aaron's movement. This is Basel's movement. This is Argentina's movement. This is Gilles' movement. This is Al Jazeera's movement. This is the EU's movement. This is every sane citizen's movement. This should be the world's movement. This movement, which is in small part about freeing culture, which is in big part about making democracy respond to the sane insights of decent people. This is the world's movement we need to join. And it's time we won this movement.